So, uh, hi, thank you all for coming. Uh, my name is uh, Ofer Moore. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, a few things about myself. Uh, I work for Synopsys. How many of you know the name Synopsys? Oh, it's getting better. <laughs> so, uh, for those of you who don't know, Synopsys um, is building one of the strongest uh, forces in uh, software testing, security testing as well. Uh, by acquiring Coverity and Codenomicon and Seeker, which was my company, and a few more. And if you want to hear more about it, we have a booth, and by that I'll end my commercial plug. Um, I was the founder of Seeker. I was a pioneer of what the technology called IS, Interactive Application Security Testing, which I'll mention today in the context of, of what we do. Uh, I'm a hacker at heart. I've been doing security and pen testing for 20 years now. And I've been with OASP almost as long, at least as long as OASP existed. I'm also a photographer, and I always say I'd rather talk about my last trip to Africa than about security. Uh, but apparently that doesn't get you accepted into OASP talks. So that's the closest thing I could find for Agile. <laughs> um, you know, cheetahs are... Take yeah, I took the picture. Cheetahs are Agile, so... You know, and that, that, that will be my last plug on Africa, unfortunately, for this talk. Um, so what I'm here to talk about is agile security. And I know everybody talks about agile security, so I want to do my own take on it. And my own take on it is, is real world. So we've been working a lot with customers with my product on trying to help them build security testing into the agile world. And what this talk will be about is not going to be about technology. It's going to be about the process on how to do that and not how to do that in theory and in good ideas and in best practices, but how three very different organizations with very different maturity levels have done this. And this is what I'll talk about. And just to get a little bit context, we'll talk a little bit about the challenge. I assume majority of you are aware of it. But when we look at agile security, right? So it's really security, software security as part of an agile development life cycle. In theory, we have the same challenges and problems as we have with normal software security, right? We have developers that write code. They probably don't know much about security. That's a reality. Um, and we need to help them. The only problem is it's in much shorter cycles, right? So we have very short cycles, very rapid delivery. We see this going from four-week sprints to three-week sprints to one-week sprint to daily sprints to rapid deployment and, you know, 3,000 pushes to production a, a day. Uh, that's, that's the world. And so we need the security to be done as part of the development by the developers. And developers don't do security. They don't like security. They don't care about security, and when we train them about security, after five months, they go to a new job, and we get a new developer that doesn't know security. <laughs> yeah, I, just the truth. Um, I, I love training. I, I love training. I've been pushing training. I did security training for developers before it was popular, but the reality is it's difficult as, as the main solution, right? Um, and so we t say, okay, so let's bring out all those testing tools, automated testing tools, and use them. And that's not a bad idea, but we need the right tools because a lot of these tools tend to generate too much data uh, that requires sifting through, right? And we see that some companies solve this by offering a product and service, but that has a turnaround time of seven days maybe, uh, and that's very long. And some companies just hire experts, but that's, again, very slow, right? We I talked to a lot of customers that have all kinds of solutions, and they have a team of people sifting through false positives. And that doesn't work when you need something done from today to tomorrow. And so we need an ability to sift through the data. But we also need an ability to build something practical, which realizes that when you push code every day, you're going to push code with vulnerabilities sometimes. And that's fine as long as you manage your risk correctly and and you're aware of what you're doing. And so this is a little bit about the challenge and what we're trying to do. And so the solution, and that's true for anything in Agile, is automation. Automation is key. Anything you think you're going to do manually is an automatic fail. It, it can't work. I've seen customers, I've just talked to a customer, they bought uh, one of one of our competitors, static analysis, it has nothing to do with the competitor specifically. Um, they build a program where everything high breaks the build, and 
then somebody has to look at it and say if it's a false positive or not. And that was working very cool when they started one system, but now they're trying to expand it and they need 50 more security people to do that fast enough. So we need automation. So we need something that's automated, we need something that's continuous, that can work all the time, and we need something that's practical. And practical is important because it's very easy to look at a code and say, look, there are 500 problems here. But we're not going to fix 500 problems from today to tomorrow when we push the build. <coughs> so let's look a little bit at what we did with some of our customers and what they did to, to do that. Um, so the first company, it's an insurance company. Um, they were the least mature of our customers in the that context. Um, they didn't really have Agile. They still don't entirely have Agile. They have Agile in some places. Um, they don't have automation at all, not for other things than security. So bringing in security automation was a big challenge. And um, actually on AppSec, they were pretty good because they're an insurance company, financial services. So they used to have a lot of pen testing and consulting and so on. But as they were thinking uh, on moving to Agile, this started becoming a problem. So we came there, the insurance company, mostly homegrown applications, about 15 systems that they want to bring in, with very different level of agile maturity. And that's one of the things you get when you go to a customer. We are all agile today. If you go to somebody and ask you, are you agile? Yes, definitely, we're agile. <laughs> we're all agile. Who isn't agile in this room? Nah. Oh, one. <laughs> But the reality is, um, at best, they have some Agile, uh, probably not fully implemented. Uh, most large organizations would have different departments at different maturity levels. And you can't just try and plug in this great solution that works for everything. Because it doesn't work. You need to be able to adapt. So they were very, they still are. We've been working with them for a year. They're still very different in different places. Um, so some of, they have one project, the new project, which is really agile, and then the majority of the others have just continuous integration, build servers, and they call it agile, right? Um, so the focus was out of these systems to focus first on the new systems and then expand. We're still in the process. Um, <laughs> and then they had a lot of challenges. So obviously it's, you know, it's an insurance company, a lot of, um, older developers, people that are not used to the fast-paced, agile world and security problems, been working there for 15, 20 years. Most of them know nothing about security. Um, as I said, different agile maturity and insufficient test automation. So one of the things with our product when we come in, we integrate to your test automation. And so if you have test automation, it's great because then we can leverage off that for the security testing. If you don't have test automation, well, it's harder, so that's another challenge. Um, and their security department is really small, right? We're talking about a medium-sized insurance company, and they have about four or five people in security. That includes network security and you know policy and training and everything. Um, <coughs> at the same time, they have very strong regulatory requirements, so they need to meet regulation and a lot of technologies. So those were the challenges. And what we did, and the first thing, and this will, I'll repeat that thing a lot, right? It's all about creating the right process. Because to do this right, we need to get support from R&D or DevOps. And I'll tell you right away, if you're trying to do that, this is your first challenge. Get the support from the R&D and DevOps. If they're opposing, you're not going to be su successful. It's, it's just not going to work. This has to go into their hands. At the end of the day, when you want to do security in Agile, it has to be done by the people who build the application every day, not by the security people. You're just not going to be able to keep up. Um, but at the same time, the security wanted visibility. So we created a committee um, that works together. That's insurance companies. They like committees. <laughs> so <laughs> we can call it the work group. So they created a committee uh, that meets once a week. 
they're not very fast agile. They do like three, four week sprints, not continuous delivery. Um, and talks about all the projects and give a go, no go for going uh, live. But at the same time, the, the all the daily work is managed by the R&D, but the security can open and look at all the findings. So the security feels comfortable, they have visibility, but they don't have to actually spend resources on a daily basis on it. Just before the weekly committee, they get a report, they can dive into the details and make the decision. Um, we did very basic R&D training. And when I say very basic, we're talking about like a couple of hours of security awareness. The point was not to make the developers security experts because we all agree on that, that doesn't really work. Um, the point was to get them aware of what's going to happen and why security is important. So the first hour was FUD, you know, just, oh, look how I can hack your insurance company. Um, and then the second hour was, well, here are some things like SQL injection, cross scripting you should try and avoid. But the point is that the product gives them the findings. They just need to be aware that they should care about that. <laughs> and then we created a risk policy. And for them, what they said was, we want only high or critical vulnerabilities to be blockers because this is as much as we can handle right now. Maybe later we mature better and that's fine. But for now, so we built uh, the process that everybody, everything that gets tested, if it's medium or lower, it's going, going to the queue for fixing, but it doesn't block the process. And higher critical does block. Um, and then we created multiple output channels, meaning for every time we have findings, some can go in ticketing, so the developers can get it, and in reports, so the security guys can get it, and in, there's an HTML and a PDF and everything for everybody that feels they need to know something because there are a lot of stakeholders in a large company, and they all feel like they should get the reports, even though most of them don't look at them. <laughs> Reality. Um, so we had, obviously, like with any... Um, environment, we have to integrate into the existing Agile DevOps framework. So they had uh, Jenkins for CI, it's pretty standard. I would say 80% of our customers do that. Um, that pulls code from the Java and .NET repositories. They had HP Quality Center for ticketing. We don't care. Um, they had some static analysis in place, which was mainly for quality, not for uh, security. Wasn't our product somebody else's product. Um, but funnily enough, they didn't integrate that into the continuous integration process because that static analysis created so many false positives uh, they couldn't use it, right? <coughs> and so they have continuous integration artifacts are deployed to a test environment that was very simple. There's a static environment, meaning there's the same server, gets the new version, gets to run the tests. Pretty straightforward. There was almost no test automation. They're working on that, <coughs> but almost nothing. Um, again, reality. You go to customers, do you do test automation? Sure. How much, what percentage of your tests is automated? Three. <laughs> and so sometimes they say all of it, and then you know they're lying. <laughs> but if, if you can get to 70, 80%, you're doing really good. Um, majority of people are way far than that. Um, we're at about 70, 80 percent, so that's good. Um, and then all of the functionality testing was manual. So what we did, uh, so we integrated our product seeker, it's a runtime code analysis that um, tests for vulnerabilities. We integrated to launch from the continuous integration. So every time there's a new build, product is launched. Uh, for them, that's about once a day. Um, integration with automated and manual testing. So this is an important uh, bit. Because their automated testing is very limited, and the way our product works is it leverages off the testing to better learn the application, uh, we did a setup, an initial setup, where we integrated with their manual testing. So we recorded all their manual testing and put it into our product, which could then replay it. Because if you now change a small piece of code, you have to test it for security. And if it's not covered by the automated testing, we will not see that. 
And then we created multiple outputs, right? So Jenkins integration, so the test results uh, go or no go to the Jenkins. If it's high or higher, we break the build. And so the Jenkins can break the build like other things can break the build. Even their the little test automation they had could break the build only on very rare cases. Um, and everything else, or everything actually was pushed into the bug tracking. Okay, one of the way our product works is that it's very intense on, on verifying vulnerability and creating exploits. So you don't get false positives, you get just a small amount of actual findings. And that is something that the R&D can work with. And then a PDF report was automatically generated and emailed for a mailbox where I don't think anybody reviews it, but <laughs> it's there for, <laughs> it's there. Now, I, I, it, they used it for the committee, right? So once a week, they sit and look at all these reports from um, the different systems, and they decide, can we push the next version, right? So even though things there weren't high and didn't break, the security guy can say, well, I still don't feel comfortable or whatever. So that's, you know, that was one, one case. And this is how our Jenkins looks there. These are the different systems. You see all the green ones um, are ones where um, we're fine. These may be ones that we have problems and, and broke and so on. Gives a pretty nice view to the build guys. Okay. How are we on time? Good. So the second case was a little more interesting in the sense that we got into a customer that knew zero about security but was very mature in terms of agile and automation. So that makes it, I, I'd say, I'd say our, our, our deployment there is more interesting. But So it's a UK retailer e-commerce platform. Um, it's a single platform. It has flavors, meaning you know different brands, but it's the same platform really. Um, and they're a run-of-the-mill agile shop. Scrum-based, three-week sprints, very strict enforcement. I actually really like them. They, they work the way Agile is planned, meaning if something doesn't work at the end of three weeks, it's out. They don't say, well, then this build will come out on Tuesday instead of Monday. No. They come out on Monday every three weeks. It's not there, it's out. And very strong automation. I wouldn't say 100%, but they had almost, really close. <coughs> the main challenges was they didn't know anything about security. The reason they talked to us was because they got hacked. They got hacked on this really lame, simple SQL injection. Sorry, I mean, th they used to have this Pentest company doing them Pentests twice a week. Uh, a Pentest company that obviously can't Pentest. <laughs> Because we ran our, the first time we came for a POC, we ran our product and we found like 15, you know, simple cross-site scriptings and SQL injections. I, I'm not even talking about fancy stuff. Just, and they show me a report from a month of, a, we have nothing, really? Change the company. Um, so very limited security, very limited security staff. They had two people in security and that included physical security for their stores. The guy that was the head of security, information security or security, he was ex-police. Um, <laughs> obviously, the developers didn't know anything about security, and um, there was no process. There was nothing. We came in, there was nothing. But the good thing was um, that after this incident, the guy that actually picked it up was the guy from the R&D from the DevOps side. And after security brought us in and did the POC and said, well, the product works and we like them, the whole thing was run by R&D. Security was pushed out, and that's the best way to do it. And when I say pushed out, it's not that they didn't care. They knew what was happening. They were involved. They got information on what we we're planning to do, but they didn't interfere at all with the process. They let the R&D people drive it because the R&D people need to use it, right? <laughs> so we created a workflow with the R&D that they liked, which said, we will do security testing just once a week. 
They had a pretty large platform. The test took a few hours, and because they were very heavy on automation, they didn't want to uh, slow down their regular automation because you have to push it in between something. Um, and so they said, we want to do uh, security testing. So the way their sprints work, three weeks, two weeks they write new functionality, third week is just fixing and, and uh, making sure everything is in place. So at the end of week one, at the end of week two, over the weekend when they have more slots for automation, they would run uh, the test. And then at the third weekend, which is the pre-build weekend, they would run the verification. If this fails, out. Breaking medium or higher, and I said very strict three weeks policy, and that wasn't easy to get in. It wasn't easy to get in the thing that says the same way you push out a functionality that doesn't work, you push out a functionality that isn't secure. Um, it took some persuasion. Uh, again, we were just wor working with R&D, the security weren't even in those meetings. But eventually they agreed and this works. This actually works till today. You'll see some of these slides are about two years old. This still works and I, I really like the way they work. So week one, week two finds new vulnerabilities. Week three verifies them. Something fails strictly out. Um, everything on the side gets reported to the security group. They don't have the resources. Seriously, they really don't look at it. There's no committee. They don't care. It's mostly for auditing purposes. It's all stored. I'll show you later their logs. You can see the reports back going years, and you can make sure that the process worked. In the next incident that hopefully will never happen, you'll be able to go back and see that work has been done and things have been fixed and so on. <coughs> so in terms of environment, uh, it's pretty standard. Jenkins, Jira, you know, the usual suspect. The one uh, more interesting challenge that we had there was that everything was in the cloud. So they don't have testing environments, they have cloud testing environments, and they rebuild them every time. It's not a single environment that gets the same code, but rather they have the script, it creates Amazon machines, pushes the code, pushes the database, pushes the mock data in, pushes everything, sets up an environment, <laughs> runs a test on that, then erases it. Um, I see more and more of this now. When, when we came there two years ago, it was pretty impressive. Today it's becoming uh, more. So each environment is four servers. Um, initially when we came, they wanted to put our product as part of their normal test environment. As I said, the, the full test took a few hours. Even for the weekend, that was a little bit difficult for them to push. And so we decided to create a new environment for security testing. One of the benefits of these scripts, it's very easy to spin a new machine. Um, and so once a week they spin a new environment just for security purposes. They, we had to help them. They automatically deploy, after they deploy their product, they deploy our product on that and launch, um, and launch that. Oh, I ran ahead of myself. <coughs> so, uh, we integrate there with Selenium. All of their automation is done with Selenium. So, we record their Selenium. So, in fact, when they deploy their existing testing environment with the latest test automation, we deploy something small just to record that traffic and get all the latest um, test data. And then we use that on our uh, orchestrated environment. Then the tests result get integrated back into the Jenkins. There is an HTML report, uh, and of course, we can break builds. So that's, that's the result of a single run. That's an HTML that gets embedded into the Jenkins. You can click on it from the Jenkins, and the Jenkins parses. There's a script in the Jenkins that parses this, and if there are medium, high, or critical vulnerabilities, it will break. And then this is the PDF reports that are stored. Um, you can barely see anything, but that just goes a long way back. And they can click this and they get the report. So we scripted with them all that and helped them build all that. And they have all the reports from the day we started working there. Security can access this at any time. The security here didn't want any access to the ticketing, to the JIRA. It's, it's not our world. Just give us a PDF report where we can go and look. <coughs> uh, 
Questions? Okay. So, my last case. Last case was a little bit trickier just because it was a much bigger organization. Until now, we've dealt with one group, um, you know, pretty simple. This company is a very large e commerce retailer, it's among the top 10 in the US. Um, they're very mature in every possible aspect you can think of. They are mature in security. They have a bunch of static analyzers and scanners and pen tests and everything you, won't, you can think about. Um, and they're mature in terms of agile. They've been doing this huge agile transformation process for a long time, like all the retailers. If you don't know, you see this a second retailer. Amazon is driving everybody in retail to agile because they're killing everybody. So, um, very advanced agile DevOps process. Uh, everything's orchestrated, everything's um, automated. And one of the challenges that we've seen was it's a very complex site. It's hundreds of developers. It's, I don't remember how many, a couple of dozen different groups that develop different parts of the front end, different parts of the back end, and some of them have different processes and different ownership. And so each part needs to be dealt with. The findings, you know, when we look at an application, we look at an entire application, but findings may be related to different divisions and different departments. And so that was part of, of um, the challenge there. So the first challenge was introduction of security automation in QA and DevOps. Before that, all the security tests were done either at the development level static analyzers or post-production by scanners and security people. The QA team, DevOps, were not in the loop until we came. <coughs> the second challenge, as I said, multiple components for multiple teams, which uh, I'll get into a bit later, but created all kinds of problems in, in getting the results in the right path. Um, Extremely dynamic testing environment. What do you mean? So just like the previous example, they had everything orchestrated, but unlike the previous example, it wasn't a nice set of four servers that gets orchestrated. Their system could be one day five servers and the next day 20 servers because they decided they need more search testing and created 15 instances of the search server and so on. Um, the other issue was they being that they are a large retailer, and Amazon is obviously their competitor, they don't want to use Amazon Cloud. <laughs> That's pretty common, actually. <laughs> and so um, they, so some of them, some I've seen a lot of retailers. Some of them would just go to things like Google, Microsoft. Um, they built their own. Um, so they had their own CI, their own cloud, which is essentially a, a you know, big virtual machine servers that can orchestrate new machines and, and so on. Um, everything, except for Selenium, which they used, and I think Jira, we'll see that in a minute. Everything else they used was their own, which we had to work with. Um, and as I said, very highly uh, agile, rapid environment, daily builds, daily delivery. As, as we see with modern things. And so we needed a path that can be allow for writing code and testing for functionality, then security and delivering in less than 24 hours. <coughs> Obviously, security could not be involved in the process. So in the previous example, security didn't have the resources and didn't want to be involved. But here, the, the pace is just, just too fast. They can't be involved. They can only audit. Um, and 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 we see more and more of this. We just I just met a customer, well, a prospect, last week that has over 300 pushes a day into production. Is that a result of the task that you want to Sorry. Is that a result of the task that you want to scan? What is? Uh, what do you mean? It's a static analysis. This is not a result. This is a challenge. This is. You need to be able to write code and push it in less than 24 hours. The problem is if you go to uh, certain technologies like static analysis, 
Some of them are slow, but even if they're fast, they generally tend to generate uh, false positives at some degree, some better, some worse, but they t uh, generate false positives. And they also generate things that are more around you know, bad coding practices. So you need somebody to look at that and say, this needs to be fixed and this can wait. And this somebody is too slow. You need something that's more automated. Anything that's not fully automated breaks on in these speeds. You can later uh, look at all the rest of the things that you decided is not critical. So I said, you have to be able to go with some vulnerabilities live as long as you have a process for dealing with them later in a reasonable time frame. But you can have something that requires human inter uh, interference in such short cycles because it's just too slow. <coughs> so in this case, we were brought in by the security. Um, it was a nice story. So they have static analyzer and development, which is used, I don't even know exactly it, what process. And they have a um, black box scanner that they use in production. And the black box scanner found vulnerabilities. So obviously the static analysis process wasn't good enough because the way they saw it, the thing they run in production is just to make sure nothing slipped through the cracks. If it finds something, it's a fail. And that was actually, we met the customer and they told us the POC will do with you is do that in the process, get a thing done. If we find something after you guys are done, then you're not helpful. We need to make sure that a black box scanner doesn't find anything in production ever. They are very security conscious. <coughs> so it was initiated by the security, but um, they got DevOps on board, right? Because it has to be in DevOps. And so we gave DevOps and QA training, but the training was not at all about security. They don't know security. They don't care about security. They don't actually deal with the security because they just run a tool and the developers have to fix it, right? What the training was, was on the process. What do you do? Why do you do it? When does it break? When doesn't it break? When do you need to shout on the developers? And so on. <coughs> um, and they wanted security tests to run as part of the other testing. So in the same environment, um, as not once a week, but daily build, or whenever you build and run functionality testing, you run security testing as well. And that requires some resources, but they own the cloud, so they just pumped up the machine a little bit uh, to support that. Um, and for them, as I said, medium already blocks. If they have a medium finding, which shouldn't be in the first place because they were supposed to find it during the early stages of development with static analysis, but we know things slip through the crack. So medium blocks, the only thing they allowed was low. If it's low, uh, they put it in the bug tracking and deal with it, but medium or higher breaks the build. <laughs> As I said, from there, the verification metrics was if we see in production anything, we failed. This has to resolve that. Until now, we're good. Um, and then security group just supervises the process and has visibility to reports. Again, that's the same message you get here every time. So, as I said, they have their own CI, orchestration, cloud, everything. Um, we didn't care that much because, you know, our, we have pre-built integration, but essentially we have a bunch of web services you can work with. So, um, so they do daily builds, daily creation of cloud environment, orchestration, build the whole system, build their own testing, build our product into that, run their own testing, run our product, get results. Um, they had a bunch of different automations, part with Selenium, part with their own scripts, required some more integration on our part, but pretty standard. <coughs> and then, as I said, the orchestration uh, scripts that normally build their test environments were adapted to include us in that. And if they created multiple load balanced instances, then we would appear at all of them to make sure that we don't miss anything. Uh, full CI integration <coughs> and 
every single automation test that ran was directed to run through our product for recording. So we saw everything that happens in automation and we could do the full security test daily for whatever part. And part of this from their perspective, again, automation proper, they don't want to test everything every day, just the changes, but their scripts already support that. So they only run the new things and then we record and test whatever they decide to run their automation on. So that's another big issue you might encounter. If it's a big system, you might not always want to test all of it every day. But if you have a mature customer from automation perspective, they already understand that. <coughs> and then we did Jira bug tracking integration. And actually, this for us, it was the first time when we developed this capability. So as I mentioned, we have different, they have different groups, different teams, different parts, and then what do you do with that? If you just open a ticket, who deals with it? So you need somebody to allocate the ticket to the right group. That's a person, and as we said, people are not wanted in this process. So we actually developed um, capability to discover based on the classes or the code base which team it belongs to and automatically allocate that in the JIRA. So everything goes directly to where it needs to go automatically. I use the word automation a lot in this lecture, <laughs> but it really it's the only way um, to go about that. And then they still run, after they deploy to production, they run their black box scanner, and for now we're doing good. That's it. Questions? Go ahead. How long did these projects take? And at the end, how did you know that you were successful? How long did these projects take? So it's very different between the different cases. The last one was almost a year, even though they're mature because they're a big company and it takes long. Um, the, the second one, the British retailer, was three months because they were in a hurry because they got hacked and that kind of helps. And the insurance company, um, let's say somewhere in between. I'd say, it's, well, it, we're still in process with them. We got, it took us about half a year to get them up and running, but only on some of the systems, and then we're still working with them on the rest of the systems. Uh, how do we know we're successful? Uh, Process-wise or security-wise? So process, no, so process wise, you see, you see when the process is working. You see when new code is checked in, it's being tested by the system. We have, we find things, they get fixed, they get re-verified. Did, did the customer set goals for you and say? So only the last one, and I said, the last one had very strict goals. Yeah. Zero findings with a black box scanner, um, which is, I don't know if it will last forever, but you know, it's, it's a good goal, and for now, we're, we're doing well. Um, I think for other customers, they just wanted to, to see that it works. I think we all understand that security is about risk management, and if you set a goal like, I will never, ever have a vulnerability in my code again, we all know that's not a realistic goal. Um, No. So we had customers said that the, I mean, for instance, the, the, the second case I mentioned, we moved from, we originally wanted to do a daily test and we moved to a weekly test because for them, the resources it required were so that it was too much for them and you know, they wanted to do it once a week and was enough for them from the pr their internal process for doing and fixing it. So, more questions? No? Questions about South Africa? <laughs> no? It's great, you should go there. It's much more fun than application security. <laughs> How close were you to the chief on the first picture when you took it? Uh, pretty close, although I have a long lens. <laughs> yeah. They're actually pretty nice, the cheetahs. They don't go after people most of the time. <laughs> Good. Thank you all for coming, especially for the last talk of the day. Thank you.